Chapter One of Peggy's Trial. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. Chapter One A Disappointment. Peggy Clayton stood on the front steps with her ten-year-old forehead puckered into half-century wrinkles. She had followed her father out of the house, watched him toss his medicine case up to Jim in the buggy, climb in himself, wave a last goodbye, and drive up the street at a speed which soon whisked them around the corner out of sight. As this was what happened every morning, there was apparently no reason for the lines on the forehead or the deep sigh with which she turned slowly into the house. She had hardly shut the door before a voice shouted, "'Did you ask him? What did he say?' Along with the words, a small boy came sliding down the banisters and landed in triumph on his feet beside her. "'Ted,' said his sister severely, "'you are a bad boy.' You know Nurse said you were not to slide down those banisters with your new suit on. Bother, Nurse, answered Teddy, nevertheless surveying two short trouser legs with some apprehension. Did Father say you could? he added impatiently. Peggy drew him into the office and closed the door. I never got a chance to ask him, she said disconsolately. He was giving nurse directions about Harry's foot, and then Mr. Carter came in. "'Mr. Carter!' exclaimed Teddy in surprise. "'Why, he went more than half an hour ago. Why didn't you ask then?' Peggy opened the door, looked up and down the hall, and shut it carefully again before she answered. "'Nurse was there right after and told about our going down to the river yesterday,' and she said she was sure Harry got his foot hurt climbing over the stone wall, and he left word that we were never to go there again without asking permission first. "'Bother!' said Teddy, with all the emphasis that word could carry. "'Well, why didn't you ask him after that?' Peggy looked at him scornfully. "'With Nurse just complaining about us? He'd have said no, sure.' "'Nurse is always complaining.' said Teddy, wagging his head judicially. If you wait to ask till she isn't saying disagreeable things, you'll never get the party. And besides, added Peggy forlornly, if I don't have it Thursday, Cora May will be gone. Cora May was a visitor in town. Teddy had decided more than two weeks before, which was almost immediately after her arrival, that she was much the prettiest and nicest girl he knew. Except, of course, Peggy. No one so far had ever been superior to Peggy. The party without Cora May, therefore, struck him as being ridiculous and not to be considered for a minute. If Nurse hadn't been so hateful, he scolded, we could have had the party all right without asking him at all. Well, replied Peggy, we can't ask him now, for he won't be home till late this evening. And Cook says if she doesn't know today, she won't have time to make the cake. Just then Nurse's voice was heard reminding them that if they didn't hurry, they would be late for school. It's always school time, grumbled Ted. Wish I'd hurt my foot instead of Harry. He always does have the luck. I don't call it much luck to have to sit in a chair all day with your foot on another, said Peggy. It's foolish to make a fuss about going to school, she added virtuously. Tisn't a bit more foolish, flared Teddy, than to make a fuss about an old party. I don't care if you don't have one at all. His nose was as high in the air as that already turned up article would go. Peggy's feelings were much hurt. You are pretty mean, she sputtered. I'll tell Cora May you don't want her to come. Then I guess she'll think you are polite. She pursed up her lips tightly as she put on her things and started off at a rapid pace down the street. Teddy followed, tugging at the jacket Peggy usually helped him into.
Just then, around the corner, came a bright-eyed, charmingly dressed young lady. She called a cheerful greeting to the children. The two gave a simultaneous shout and threw themselves bodily upon her. The young lady was Miss Edith Barton. She was Peggy's Sunday school teacher, and quite the loveliest lady, according to all three Clayton children, that ever lived. "'It seems to me,' said Miss Barton, after a moment's survey of the two flushed faces, "'that all is not quiet on the Potomac. What's up, youngsters?' "'We've both been cross,' answered Peggy. Her honesty did not incline her to take more than her share of the blame. "'But the real trouble is that I wanted to ask Father if I couldn't have a party Thursday for Cora May, and I didn't get a chance. Now I shan't see him till tonight, and that will be too late for the cook to know.' "'I should think Nurse would settle that matter,' said Miss Barton. "'She doesn't want us to have one.' confessed Peggy. But it's just because she wants to go away that afternoon and she thinks we can't have a party without her. Ted's voice expressed great scorn. Miss Barton's eyes twinkled. Nurse has had the care of you so long, she said apologetically. You can't wonder she thinks you need her all the time. But perhaps we can persuade her to delegate her authority. Teddy's eyes opened, and Peggy bent her brow in a frown. The meaning of such big words was beyond them. Miss Barton laughed and pinched Peggy's cheek. "'Which means that if somebody else, almost as old and as wise as nurse as herself, could be there, perhaps she would agree to the party.' "'There isn't anybody else so old,' said Peggy gloomily. "'and she thinks she's the only person who knows anything about taking care of children.' "'The young lady studied the two, her eyes laughing. "'Peggy's coat looked as if it might have been brushed a week ago. "'Her skirt had a rip in it, which evidently was not a very recent happening. "'Teddy's boots, perhaps, could be dirtier, but probably would not look so. "'The laugh went out of Miss Barton's eyes, and the little flush crept up her cheeks.' She suddenly bent down and kissed Peggy. "'Nurse has had a good deal of experience,' she said, "'and I am afraid you don't always make it as easy for her as you might. "'But I think she will agree to this other wise lady taking her place. "'Because you see,' she straightened Teddy's necktie as she spoke, "'the wise lady is myself.' Peggy gave a whoop that would have done credit to the lungs of a youthful Apache, and threw both arms about the waist of the lady. "'Will you? Aren't you good? Ted, Ted, do you hear?' The small boy didn't seem fully to realize the blessing so suddenly descended upon him. "'We can have the party. Miss Barton's going to be there.' "'If you don't hurry up and get to school,' said this straightener of difficulties, "'you'll be kept in so late Thursday you won't have any time for a party at all.' "'Run along, children, and I'll go up to the doctor's and tell Nurse.'" End of Chapter 1「Chapter 2 of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett The Party after that, of course, there was no more trouble. Harry at first felt greatly aggrieved that Peggy should have any party at all when he couldn't join in the games. To his mind, the presence or absence of Cora May was a matter of minor importance. "'She's only an outside girl,' he complained. "'She isn't your brother like me.' Luckily for the family's peace, Miss Barton understood the art of soothing small boys' hurts. Thursday afternoon, when Peggy and Ted got home, they found Harry in his new white PK suit, with all signs of disturbance gone. Nurse had already left, and Miss Barton helped him dress. She had beguiled the time with such exciting stories of Indians and cowboys that he forgot his lame foot. Moreover, she had promised that next month, on his eighth birthday, she would take him to Scranton to see Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. That was the finishing balm for Harry's wounded spirit. 
neither Ted nor Peggy had ever been to the Wild West show. With such an exciting prospect before him, he was able to view with cheerfulness the better times of the other two this afternoon. The party was to be outdoors, with games on the big lawn and tea in the orchard. A hand-organ man came into town that morning, and Miss Barton secured him at once for orchestra. At four o'clock most of the children had arrived, and as they trooped out of the house, he wound out the strains of a lively march. Miss Barton and Harry sat on the piazza with trays full of bright-hued ribbon rosettes. Each boy took one from Miss Barton, while Harry passed his to the girls. Those whose rosettes matched in color were thus made partners. The first thing Miss Barton said was to be a grand march, and she chose Peggy and Dickie Aiken for leaders. Up and down, around and across, the two piloted the line. Dickie was as full of brilliant ideas as Peggy, and the maneuvers they managed between them were wonderful to see. In the very center of the lawn was a tall pole decorated with wreaths of flowers. Long colored ribbons hung from its top, two of them being decidedly shorter than the others. Toward the end of their convolutions, Peggy and Dick led their followers into a circle about this pole. Then Miss Barton clapped her hands and commanded them all to stop just where they were. She told each child to take the end of one of the floating ribbons, reserving the shortest two for Peggy and Dick. Now, she said, you two are to dance to the music, and whatever kind of step you take, the ring outside is to imitate it. No matter what figures you make, none of you must drop the ribbons. Then the organ reeled out a gay waltz. Peggy and Dick faced each other and started into a most remarkable exhibition of high kicking all about the pole. It was not easy, they found, always to keep the ribbons ends, to dance in step, and at the same time to continue circling about the pole. At the end of two minutes, Miss Barton clapped her hands again. Peggy and Dick dropped the short ends and two others took their places. Thus it went on till all the couples had been leaders. Of course, each pair tried to outdo those who had gone before. Most of them attempted all sorts of funny antics, jumping as high as they could and filling in the pauses of the music with ridiculous bows and curtsies. Cora May's turn came last of all. By means known only to himself, Ted had managed to be her partner. Now, Ted was not noted as a dancer. He could climb trees or run races with the best, but somehow in dancing his feet always seemed in his way. This time, as he and Cora sprang into the center of the group, neither he nor anyone else ever minded his feet at all. The truth was, Cora May, in her tiny slippers, was a veritable thistle-down. No one who danced with her could help being infected with something of her own spirit and grace. Forward and back the two went, then they balanced partners, tiptoed around each other, crossed hands, and finally ended with a whirling waltz all about the pole. The whole thing was such a pretty dainty bit that the children applauded vigorously at the close. Harry and Miss Barton held a whispered consultation for a few minutes. We have tried to be as impartial, she announced, as if we were twenty judges instead of two. Everybody has done beautifully, but we think the prize ought to go to Cora May and Ted. The rest of the children clapped harder than ever as she hung a lovely necklace of blue Venetian beads about Cora's neck and gave Ted a big Japanese kite. Peggy, however, regarded this last donation with some disfavor. Dick dances lots better than you do, she said to Ted plainly. It's only because Cora May did so well that no one noticed you. But Ted was quite untroubled. Of course, he said sweetly. You don't suppose I was such a goose not to know that, did you? Why, if she had a turkey for partner, it wouldn't matter. After the dancing came a hunt for peanuts. They were hidden all over the lawn in crevices of the stone wall, in an old bird's nest that hung low on a broken limb, under the piazza steps, among the rose bushes, everywhere and anywhere. Then they were all marched down to the orchard. Here beneath the wide branches was a long table set with all kinds of good things to eat. Harry was helped to a chair at the very head. 
he was allowed also to cut the fairy cake, as Miss Barton called a white frosted affair that filled a big silver salver. Before the first slice was made, she stood in front of it and in a solemn tone repeated these lines. Cake, O oh cake of wondrous bake, of thy sweetness we'd partake. Give us each for fairy's sake, gifts thou hast within thy make. Then with a long slender knife, Harry boldly plunged into the very heart of this white mystery. No wonder Miss Barton called it a fairy cake. What other name was suitable for one whose every slice hid within its yellow creamy side some little gift? Of course, sometimes a girl found a fine glass agate or a wooden top in her portion. That didn't matter, though, for there was always a boy willing to swap for a tiny porcelain doll or pewter pitcher. It only proved that Harry had bestowed the pieces according to his own fancy, rather than as a wise fairy would have dictated. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Cora May's Trouble. Toward the end of the feast, Peggy noticed that Cora May seemed very silent. Even Ted couldn't make her laugh. Finally, when the rest began to play I Spy, Peggy found her sitting by the playhouse under the trees. She had a most forlorn expression on her face as she sat there digging holes in the ground with a stick. Peggy stood looking at her anxiously. "'Is anything the matter?' she asked. Cora had paid no attention to her except to dig holes faster than ever. "'You know I'm going home tomorrow,' she said. "'And—and and I was thinking what a nice time I'd had here, and how lovely Miss Barton is, and—and—' and, she swallowed bravely. And I wish I was you, Peggy, so I could stay here all the time. Oh, dear! Peggy tried to give the conversation a lighter tone. You wouldn't like it at all to be me. You wouldn't have such lovely curls, and you'd have big feet instead of those little teeny things you dance on just like a butterfly. Cora May smiled as Peggy meant she should, but the corners of her mouth dropped immediately afterward. "'Curls pull like everything getting combed and make me cry,' she objected. "'And your feet aren't big, and you're lots smarter than I am, and, and Dr. Clayton is your father.' "'But you have a father, too,' said Peggy. "'You showed me his picture, and I think he's just elegant-looking. "'Maybe he is,' answered Cora May unenthusiastically but I haven't seen him since I was a little bit of a girl when he left me with grandmother after mother died, and now... Her voice dropped and she looked around apprehensively. And now he's coming home with a stepmother. And I hate her. I hate her. I know I shall hate her. She burst into tears and buried her golden head in Peggy's lap. Peggy didn't know at all what to do but sat and rubbed the curls all up and down the wrong way till there wasn't a hair untangled. Peggy had read about wicked stepmothers in fairy tales more than once. Still, she had a doubt as to whether they were always true descriptions. Anyway, it was necessary to comfort Cora May somehow. But perhaps she'll be nice, she suggested timidly. Perhaps she'll be better than a grandmother. Peggy's only grandmother was her father's mother. She was very deaf and very lame, and always very much troubled by any childish pranks. But Cora May looked up indignantly. "'My grandmother is just beautiful,' she said. "'It was she told me they'd take me away from her, and I know stepmother will tell father I am horrid and he won't like me at all.' The big tears rolled down her face in streams. "'Oh, dear!' cried Peggy in deepest distress. "'Is a stepmother so bad?' Then suddenly her face lighted up and she took Cora May's hand and patted it. "'Don't you worry one bit more,' she said with tremendous relief in her tones. "'I'll tell you what to do. "'If your stepmother treats you mean, "'just you write a letter to father. 
He always looks after little girls, and he'll come right up and take you away and give you back to your grandmother. Peggy had heard from more than one grateful patient that Dr. Clayton could do anything. Cora May's aunt, too, whom she had been visiting, often said that Dr. Clayton was the only man she would always trust. Cora May was therefore quite sure he could save her from her stepmother if he chose. Now that Peggy promised he should choose, she began to feel that she might go home with less terror. A few minutes after, the doctor himself came out to the orchard. Seeing the traces of tears still on Cora's face, he picked her up and put her on his shoulder. "'Well, Lady Bird,' he said, "'are we in the lovely October weather, or is it cold, rainy November?' Cora May didn't quite understand, but Peggy knew her father's ways. Daddy! She slipped her hand confidingly into his. Daddy was the name with which she always cajoled him. If Cora May's ever in great trouble, you'll get her out, won't you? Dr. Clayton looked at the little special pleader with a twinkle in his eye. If Cora May, he answered, at the same time holding that young lady straight up in the air and shaking his head at her forlorn face. If Cora May needs me and there isn't anyone else to help her, I'll pack my grip for the next train and be there to right her wrongs as fast as steam can take me. There, said Peggy, beaming. Now, Cora, you see, when Daddy says he'll do a thing, the biggest ogre you ever heard of can't stop him. Dr. Clayton laughed. Some people call that obstinacy, Peg. I'm glad you see it's only a proper defiance of ogres. Nurse, said Peggy that night as she was undressing, our stepmother's always horrid. Nurse was just then having too bad a time with Ted to answer. He had run downstairs in his pajamas and brought up Peggy's big hoop. With this clasp in both hands, he was shouting at the top of his lungs, and making flying circus leaps in and out of the nursery and up and down the hall. Twice Nurse had caught him and put him back to bed to no purpose. Each time before she could hide the hoop, he had scrambled out and jerked it away. Dr. Clayton had given strict orders that all whippings were to be left to him. He was not at home, and the nurse was consequently at her wit's end. Ted! she cried angrily as she caught him once more and shook him pretty severely. I shall report this to your father, and he won't let you drive with him to Scranton tomorrow. That sobered Ted a little. You're a mean, cross thing, he grumbled, drawing the bedclothes sulkily over his shoulders. You don't think anybody ought to have any fun. I'm just glad you weren't here this afternoon. Miss Barton is a thousand million times nicer than you. She's got some sense. And he flopped over disgustedly onto the other side. Now, Nurse, in some ways, was not very wise, but she had done the best she knew during the six years since Mrs. Clayton's death. It hurt her feelings greatly, therefore, to be so little appreciated by the children she really loved. It was partly because of this feeling that, when Peggy repeated her question, she answered as she did. Stepmother's horrid, she sniffed. I guess you'd find out they were if you had one. You wouldn't be able to bamboozle her as you do me now, I tell you. I never knew one yet that didn't hate her husband's children. Generally, she succeeds in making him hate them, too. I guess you'd wish you had your poor tormented nurse back. Peggy's heart sank as she thought of Cora May. Then her invincible faith in her father's powers returned, and she went to sleep, sure that he would take care of her little friend. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The New Pupil. A short time after this, the doctor told Peggy that he had just heard that Cora May's father and new mother had decided to stay abroad till Christmas. That meant that Cora was to be left at her grandmother's for at least three months more. Something that wasn't going to happen for three long months seemed to Peggy too far ahead to worry about. 
Besides, just now she had more than enough matters of her own to think about. In the first place, Miss Edith Barton was going to leave town within a few days for a long visit. Peggy, consequently, spent most of her out-of-school time haunting that lady's house. The fact that her own lessons were often therefore very insufficiently prepared was to her mind of slight matter. That she might also occasionally be in Miss Barton's way never once occurred to her. And Miss Barton, in spite of letters and errands and packing, never hinted to her little admirer that she would be glad of more uninterrupted time. Meanwhile, in her absorption, Peggy never noticed the excitement that was spreading among her classmates. "'Peggy, come here,' called Lena Brooks the morning after Miss Barton's departure. "'Don't you think it's a mean shame, too?' "'What's a mean shame?' asked Peggy, joining the group at the foot of the stairs. "'Why, about that baker girl coming to our school?' "'Who's the baker girl?' puzzled Peggy. And why shouldn't she come to school? Where have you been the last week? exclaimed Hattie Harner. Haven't you seen that curly-headed beggar Miss Shepherd put into our class? Peggy's face was still a blank. Goodness gracious! Lena's tone was scornful. If I were you, I wouldn't be so wrapped up in Miss Barton that I didn't know if I was living or not. The baker girl, she went on explaining, is that little dowdy who's got Jane Miller's old seat. Oh! Peggy comprehended at last. I remember now that Miss Shepard did give a new girl that place. She had awfully pretty black curls, too. What's the matter with her, anyway? Matter? sneered Brownie Campbell, whose father owned the big cotton mills and was supposed to be the richest man in town. There's matter enough. She and her mother have just come from nobody knows where, and they have taken that hovel at the end of Walworth's pasture. "'Tisn't a hovel,' said Peggy indignantly. "'It's a very good little house. I heard Father say so only last week.' Brownie Campbell and Peggy Clayton never did agree. Peggy said Brownie put on airs because her father had a lot of money. Brownie, for her part, didn't see why Peggy should be so stuck up just because her father was a doctor. "'Never mind whether it's a hovel or not,' put in Lena Brooks impatiently. "'They are as poor as last year's potatoes, and nobody knows who they are. And Mother saw Mrs. Baker hanging out washing, and I think it's a shame to put a washerwoman's daughter into our class. Why didn't she go to the Cheswick School with the mill people's children?' "'Shish!' said Annie Rice. There she comes. Peggy turned and gazed curiously. The others pretended to be much occupied with their companions and not to see the tiny dark girl just entering the door. Her big brown eyes flashed one timid look at the knot of girls whispering and laughing together. A deep flush spread over her cheeks. With a little defiant toss of her black curls, she went upstairs without another glance. "'What's she in black for?' asked Peggy as she disappeared. Nobody knew, and just then the session bell rang and they all hurried to their classes. "'You watch the airs she puts on when she answers a question somebody misses,' whispered Annie Rice as she and Peggy took their seats together. That morning Peggy had plenty of chance for watching. She had got so far behind in her lessons that she failed in pretty nearly everything.' It so happened that the newcomer was called upon to correct many of her mistakes. Peggy was never the most brilliant scholar in her class. She was generally too much interested in things outside to give enough time to her studies, but such total failure as she made today was entirely unusual. It was especially exasperating to have this washerwoman's daughter prove herself so much better a student. At the first recess, Lena seized Peggy's arm excitedly. "'There now,' she cried. "'Did you see how the little beggar gloated at your mistakes?' Peggy was cross and sore over her errors, but she made an effort to be fair. "'Well,' she said, "'of course there wasn't any reason she should pretend not to know the answers when she did.' "'Maybe not.' Lena looked as if there was some question even about that. 
"'But she needn't have laughed fit to kill herself "'when you said a third of twenty was seven and a quarter, need she?' "'Did she do that?' "'Peggy's cheeks flushed angrily. "'Yes, she did, and she's watching all the time "'to show everybody how much she knows. "'Why doesn't she go into a higher class if she's so learned?' "'asked Peggy, with all the sarcasm her ten years could supply. "'It was a new experience for her, Dr. Clayton's daughter, to be laughed at. "'She no longer felt in the least like taking sides with black-eyed, black-robed Elsie Baker. "'Girls!' she called out a few minutes later. "'Let's go chestnutting this afternoon. "'There are some loaded trees up near Halton's Brook.' "'But isn't that right near his field where he's got that ugly cow?' Annie Rice would have been afraid of a pet lamb if it was not securely tied. The rest of the girls hooted. "'Supposing the field is near,' said Brownie Campbell. "'Cows don't waltz over stone walls, do they? "'We'll see you don't get eaten up,' she added derisively. None of them paid any attention to the little black-robed figure— sitting disconsolately alone on the window sill, Peggy had suggested the excursion because she knew Elsie must feel that she was purposely left out. The others never even once thought of her. "'I suppose,' she said to Lena as they started with their baskets that afternoon, "'I suppose Miss Barton would say we ought to treat her better, but I'm not going to be laughed at without doing a thing back so now.' Peggy's conscience was not quite at ease about the matter. Well, said Lena, I heard Mother say that Mrs. Chisholm called on Mrs. Baker the other day to see if she'd like to take in some washing. She did it out of kindness because she thought it might help her out. And she behaved awfully to Mrs. Chisholm. She couldn't have put on more airs if she'd been living in the biggest house in town. Mother said after that she couldn't expect to be treated well or her daughter either. Such a person, Peggy decided severely, didn't deserve consideration, and she wasted no more thoughts on the neglected Elsie. The chestnuts were so thick that they had their baskets full in no time. As they started slowly for home, Peggy announced her intention of going by the way of Halton's field. It will bring me out nearer the store, she explained, and I've got to get some pencils for tomorrow. "'But that ugly cow's there!' exclaimed Annie Rice in terror. "'I don't think she is,' said Peggy. "'I'm pretty sure Mr. Halton has shut her up in his barn. "'And anyway, I can keep along by the stone wall on this side "'and not cross over till I get to the next field.' "'None of the rest wanted to go that way, "'and so she finally started out alone. "'Be sure to keep this side of the wall if the cow's there.' called Lena after her. "'And you'd better take off that red cape, too, if you see her,' added Annie Rice. "'She hates red, they say, as much as a mad bull.'" Peggy wasn't afraid of any kind of an animal, or of anything else her father often thought with a proud chuckle. To tell the truth, she was somewhat vain of her own courage, so now she waved her red cape fearlessly. To herself, she said that she wouldn't be such a frayed cat as Annie Rice for all the world. End of chapter 4「Chapter 5 of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. A Race for Life. When she got to the field, she looked over the wall searchingly. There, sure enough, away at the other end, browsing with head down, was the cow. Now, thought Peggy in disgust, it will take twice as long to keep on this side of the wall. I could cut across diagonally and save more than half the distance. She eyed the big red creature impatiently. She's back, too, she reasoned, and she's eating so fast she'll never notice me way on this side at all. I don't believe she's so bad anyway she concluded, with which she climbed the wall and let herself carefully down into the pasture. Madame, the cow, was still oblivious, eating away quite as if no red-caped little girl was scurrying over her domains. Peggy had gone nearly half the distance, 
and still the cow had not seen her, or seeing had taken no notice. "'I don't believe she's bad at all,' murmured Peggy with conviction. "'Most likely the reason she tossed Johnny Ryan over her head was because he threw stones at her. "'Animals,' said this fearless young person to herself with a virtuous air, "'ought to be treated as well as people.' Just at that moment, right out of a clear sky, without a breath of warning, a tremendous wave of wind struck across the field. Its suddenness almost knocked Peggy over. Her cape flew out and shook tempestuously about her. She had hard work to keep it from covering her face with its shaking folds. As she stopped and tried to straighten it out, she heard something that sounded like a low mutter of thunder. Half unconsciously, she turned and there in the far corner stood the cow, now facing her way. Her head was down, her tail angrily lashing from side to side. Peggy was not sure whether the animal's rage was directed against her or against the tempest of wind that had so unexpectedly arisen. In any case, the fury of the beast was so plainly shown that even Peggy's stout heart felt a big throb of terror. Drawing the cape about her as well as she could, she started on a run. The wind, fortunately, was coming from a side that aided rather than hindered her speed. Before she had gone more than a few rods, again sounded the low, thundering roll. She turned to look without stopping, and she had cause indeed for fear. There was no doubt now about the cow. With head still down, she was stalking over straight after the flying child. As yet, she was taking the chase rather slowly. But Peggy knew in one frightened glance that even at that rate she would certainly overtake her before she could reach the wall. Straining every muscle, the child leaped ahead, running as swift and sure as all her tomboy training had taught her. Once more a hasty look back. Horror upon horrors! The big beast was no longer lounging over the field. Tail straight out behind, she was pitching along at what seemed a steam train rate of speed. Already, Peggy thought, she could see two blood-red eyes shining from the lowered head. "'Father! Father!' she screamed at the top of her frightened voice, but still keeping enough sense never to stop her pace. Even as she ran and shouted, she knew that there was no chance for her father or anyone else to hear her. The pasture was too far from any house, and the road only struck it at one corner, the corner she was making such desperate attempts to reach." Just then, "'Drop your cape! Drop your cape! Quick!' The voice came from behind. Peggy turned. There, running along on the very top of the side wall, at imminent risk it would seem of breaking her neck, was Elsie Baker. As she ran and shouted, she was vigorously shaking something in the air. "'Drop your cape!' she screamed again. Peggy at last comprehended. With a jerk, she undid the hook at the neck and flung the red flaming cloth as far behind as she could without actually stopping. In almost no time, while Peggy had hardly made a rod's gain, the furious cow, with a roar that shook the air, had reached the cape. Within a minute, she had torn it into a thousand bits. Then, throwing up her head with another bellow, she started once more after the little figure, now not far from the wall of safety altogether too far, however, for her to hope to reach it before the stamping beast. Hi, hi, ya, ya! At that moment shrieked shrill and piercing over on the right. The cow hesitated half a second. What was that flaunting, wicked red thing waving up and down the wall over there? Hi, ya, hi, ya! came from the figure tossing the big bandana square. The cow stopped one moment in indecision. The girl she had been chasing was so near it would be a matter of only a very few big lunges to catch her. That ugly red flag was farther away. But, "'Hi there! Yai, yai, yai!' screamed the voice with all the power the young lungs could employ. That finished it for Mrs. Cow. With a shake of her wicked head and another big roar, she turned and bounded for the wall. Peggy, meanwhile, flew on panting and breathless with her strength going fast. She was dimly conscious that the heavy thuds no longer sounded so near. It was not, however, till with a gasping sob she reached the wall and with a last desperate effort climbed to the top that she saw what had happened. 
Over on the sidewall, Elsie Baker was standing, waving the red bandana kerchief and shouting wildly. As Peggy looked, her blood almost congealed with terror. For there, not ten feet away, was the maddened cow. To Peggy's eyes, it looked as if she would at the instant leap to the very top of the wall. Not one word could she make her parched, strained lips utter. In a very agony of terror, she watched, her hands clasped, her eyes bulging. And then, just as the animal seemed really about to make a huge vault for the red rag, Elsie, with one twist, sent it straight into the burning, furious eyes. Before the beast had shaken it off in a transport of rage and stamped it beneath her feet, the little black-robed figure had slipped down to the other side. When the cow raised her head, there was nothing left for her to wreak her wrath upon except some flying bits of bright red rags. End of chapter 5Chapter Six of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Friends Forever. Elsie came around the corner of the wall, and there she found Peggy lying on the grass, sobbing as if her heart would break. For a minute, Elsie stood by bashfully. You, you aren't hurt, are you? she finally asked timidly. Peggy jumped to her feet, wiping her eyes on her sleeve. Yes, I am, she jerked out between sobs. I'm hurt all inside. Oh, dear, said Elsie anxiously. I didn't see you tumble. Neither I did. Peggy pulled out a very soiled handkerchief and mopped up her face. I'm hurt inside because you saved my life, I guess. Elsie opened her eyes and stared, not understanding. Peggy marched up to her bravely. Would you mind shaking hands with me? Elsie flushed a little and shook the grimy fist softly. I treated you mighty mean, said Peggy humbly, and you've had a horrid time at school, and I was just as bad or worse than anybody, and yet you saved my life. Elsie looked decidedly uncomfortable. Oh, I don't believe she'd have killed you. If she hadn't, said Peggy with decision, she'd have mangled me so I'd have had to have false arms and glass eyes and a wheelchair. And, she added with a gulp, I guess when my father knows what you've done, well, he'll, well, I don't know what he'll do, but he'll surely give you the biggest kiss you ever got. Elsie flushed again and said something about, she'd have to go now. Peggy went up to her and put her arm around her waist. May I? she asked rather shamefacedly. May I go home with you? Elsie looked much astonished, but nodded silently, and the two started off, at first without a word. Peggy, however, was quite unused to keeping her tongue still for any length of time. How'd you know what to do with that cow? she began. Why, I've always heard Red makes bulls mad, explained Elsie, and when I saw the way your cape was flying, I was sure that was what made her so crazy. How did you happen to be there, though? questioned Peggy curiously, and how did you happen to have that red handkerchief? Elsie flushed again. I, I heard you say you were going for chestnuts, and I thought I'd see where you went so I could get some for Mother after you'd gone and I couldn't find a basket, so I took the bandana to put him in. Peggy's face turned redder still, and then suddenly she looked down. Did you ever? she exclaimed. If I haven't got my basket of chestnuts yet, and it's most full, to think, she fairly doubled up with laughter, to think I held on to that old thing all the time I was running away and didn't even drop it when I climbed the wall. Did you ever see anything so funny? The two laughed and laughed till all their mutual shyness was worn off, and they trotted the rest of the way home, talking like old friends. By the time they reached the little cottage, which Brownie called a hovel, Peggy had learned that Elsie's father had died only a few months ago, and that she and her mother had moved to Perrytown from New York City. And I guess, 
said Elsie mournfully, that we are awfully poor, for before we left New York, somebody came and took all Mama's lovely clothes and all my nice dresses. I asked her why they did, and she said we shouldn't want such things in a little country town, and that we needed the money. And since we've been here, we haven't had any servants. Mama, she choked a little as she said this, Mama has even done her own washing. Peggy thought of Mrs. Chisholm's call on Mrs. Baker, and she felt as if she would like to give that lady a shaking. She felt so still more after she had seen Mrs. Baker, for ten-year-old Peggy would as soon have thought of asking a queen with a diamond crown to turn into a scrub woman as to ask it of this lovely dark-eyed lady. When Peggy told her what had happened, Mrs. Baker's eyes grew big with fright, and she drew Elsie to her with a shudder. "'Oh, my dearie,' she said, "'supposing you had fallen off the wall into the pasture with the cow.' Pooh! Elsie waved away any such idea with scorn. "'Guess all my gymnasium practice wasn't going back on me that way.' That night Peggy told her father the whole story. She never forgot his face or his tones when he heard how the girls had treated Elsie just because she was poor. "'My daughter a snob, too,' was all Dr. Clayton said, but Peggy felt that any punishment would have been easier to bear. Then when she went on and told him of her mad race across the pasture, the color all went out of his face, and he picked her up in his arms and held her close without saying a word. "'Did you ever know such a brave girl as Elsie?' finished Peggy in triumph. "'And what can we do to pay her?' "'She's not only brave,' said Dr. Clayton somewhat huskily, "'but she has the steadiest and quickest of brains. "'She ought to make a wonderful woman, Peggy, "'and it is our place to give her the chance to do her best, "'and no matter what we do, "'we shall always owe her more than we can ever pay.' At school the next day, Peggy took her class into an empty room and told them of yesterday's happening. "'Now,' she wound up excitedly, "'I don't know what you're going to do, but I tell you this. Elsie Baker is my friend forever if she'll have me, and any girl that treats her mean needn't be nice to me. Mrs. Baker, too, is the sweetest lady you ever saw, and I don't think much of anybody who'd go there and ask her to take in washing. So now.' Luckily, the Mrs. Chisholm who had done this deed had no children. Consequently, Peggy's sweeping remarks did not create the rumpus they otherwise might have done. Instead, the girls looked at each other a little sheepishly, till suddenly Lena Brooks rose to the occasion with much good sense. Girls! She jumped onto a chair and waved her arms over their heads. We've been a pack of silly geese, and I guess we're all ashamed. Now then... Let's give three cheers for Elsie Baker. The cheers were given with all the good will in the world. When Elsie came in a few minutes later, though there were no verbal apologies, she found herself no longer the little outcast of the day before. It was the beginning of a new and better time for both Elsie and her mother. When Dr. Clayton called on Mrs. Baker to tell her how he and Peggy owed her little girl more than they could ever repay, he discovered several things. First, that Peggy was quite right in her estimate of Elsie's mother. Next, that he had once slightly known Mr. Baker. He remembered also how it was reported that his failure in business just before he died was entirely due to a dishonest partner. That set Dr. Clayton to thinking. The result was that several months later, he succeeded in making the partner hand over to Mrs. Baker a certain amount of money, enough at least, so that she was pretty sure of never again being in such desperate circumstances as when she came to Paratown and took the hovel. Some weeks ahead of this, however, she had accepted a position. Through the doctor's efforts, she was to be French and German teacher in a noted school in Scranton. She was not now, of course, absolutely obliged to do this work. The regular occupation, however, was the best panacea she could find for her loneliness so she decided to keep the place for at least a year. Thus she and Elsie left Perrytown before Christmas. The two children had grown to be such friends that Peggy felt as if she were losing a dear sister. But Mrs. Baker's last words comforted her a little. <laughs>
"'You know, my dear,' she said, "'that now there is always another home for you in Scranton. "'Whenever your father can spare you, you must come to us.'" End of chapter 6「Seven of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. A Hint of Dreadful Trouble. It was some weeks after the baker's departure, and Peggy was not having a very good time. She missed Elsie for one thing, and then for some unknown reason Miss Barton had not yet got back. That meant that a Miss Garland was still teaching the Sunday school class, and Miss Garland never gave her the nice little midweek parties that Miss Barton used to give. Miss Garland, too, never once came in between times and took Peggy and the two boys on excursions or brought them games. Miss Garland, in fact, seemed to take very little interest in Peggy, and none at all in Teddy and Harry. Privately, Peggy thought her a very poor sort of a lady, indeed. The only reason she failed to make her conviction more decidedly public was that the despised person was a friend of Miss Barton. Ted and Harry felt no such scruples about expressing their opinions. Harry had even been known to stick out his tongue at the back of Miss Barton's successor. About this time, also, the children were thoroughly agreed that Nurse was getting too pudgy for toleration. That they themselves were on a naughty streak did not occur to them. "'Why,' said Ted one day with wrath, "'she won't let a fellow do anything. "'Yesterday I had Jimmy Haynes up in the attic "'and we were just playing, "'and she kept calling for us to come down, "'and of course I wasn't going to come down for nothing. "'And then she came up and she took me by the ear "'and she most chucked me downstairs.' "'Ted was standing in front of the nursery fireplace "'as he spoke. "'His short legs were spread far apart, and his hands were tucked behind him under his diminutive coat-tails. It was an attitude he much admired in his father, and he copied it as often as he had a chance. "'What were you doing in the attic?' questioned Peggy suspiciously. "'Doing?' Teddy looked as innocent as a six-month's-old baby. "'Nothing. I was on the rocking horse, and Jamie had on his roller skates and was just skating along, dragging me and the horse after him. Nurse said we'd knock down the ceiling if we didn't stop. Guess if the whole house didn't come down in last year's tornado, that little racket wouldn't pull down a ceiling. Peggy thought that was not bad reasoning, but she was a whole year older than Ted, and she felt that she ought to be on the side of discipline. Well, you know, Father told us we mustn't jump around up there as if we were outdoors. Wasn't jumping, said Ted indignantly. "'and Jamie said twas just as easy skating as if he'd been in the rink.' "'Peggy's curiosity got the better of her moralizing. "'How did he ever pull you along on the horse?' "'Oh, we had it fixed in great shape,' explained Ted enthusiastically. "'You see, we took my skates and Harry's, "'and we fastened them under the stand of the horse, two at each corner, "'tied them on with strings.' Of course, every little while they'd come off, and then we'd go slump. But it was easy as pie and great fun. There. Harry had been cutting out puzzles in the other corner of the room, but now he came up in much excitement. That's how my skate got its front wheels broken. You can just give me yours to pay up. Well, I guess not. Ted swelled up like a turkey cock. Twasn't I smashed him, nor Jamie, either. You can make Nurse get you a new pair. She's the one busted em. She grabbed the rocking horse and she switched it round so, trying to get me off, that the skates hit a trunk and got a piece knocked off. You needn't be blaming me. Harry's blue eyes filled with tears and his mouth took a tremendous downward slant. You shall give me yours, he sputtered. It's your fault if Nurse did break them. You know she won't get me a new pair. "'Well, you can go without em, then,' said Teddy heartlessly. "'I didn't want her to come banging me round, did I? "'I didn't tell her to break those wheels.' "'Harry's eyes blazed with fury and ran over with tears at the same time. "'You're a bad, wicked boy,' he stormed, "'and I hate you.' 
With a sudden fury, he pounced on his brother and began beating him with both his clenched fists. Before Ted could defend himself, Peggy was between the two, trying to separate them. By this time, both of them were so excited that they hardly knew what they were about or whether they hit each other or Peggy. "'You are naughty boys!' she cried, still valiantly trying to act as guardian of the peace. Just then Nurse came into the room, and seeing what she thought was a three-sided fight, she swooped down on the trio remorselessly. "'Were ever three such young ones born into the world?' she scolded as she shook and parted them. "'You needn't be blaming me,' expostulated Peggy, smoothing down her dress. "'I wasn't doing a thing. That seemed like the biggest kind of a fib to nurse.' "'I guess I can see with my own eyes,' she retorted. "'And I guess your father'll have something to say when I tell him. Now you, Teddy and Harry,' she took each firmly by an arm, You'll both of you go straight to bed this minute, and you'll stay there till tomorrow morning. Telling Peggy to wait in the nursery, she marched the two boys out of the room without allowing them a word of explanation. Oh, dear, said Peggy ruefully. Now she'll go and tell Father, and he'll think I'm a wicked girl, and I can't ever make him understand. As she thought of all the consequences, her wrath grew, and by the time Nurse came back, she was in a towering rage. "'I'll tell you what I think,' she burst out as the old servant re-entered. "'I think you are an unfair, mean woman. "'You won't listen to anything anybody can say, "'and you just go and repeat everything to Father and—and—' and, "'Oh!' she stamped her foot angrily. "'You're just horrid. So now.' "'Peggy did not know that Nurse was tired out and half sick. Nor did she realize that six consecutive years with three lively children are apt to wear out the strongest of nerves. Neither did she know that a certain piece of village gossip was rankling in what was, after all, a very faithful-hearted nurse. Least of all did she guess that this same heart, the very moment before, had been feeling very sorry for Peggy herself. At this sudden onslaught, Nurse's pity gave way to anger. "'You are a saucy girl,' she said bitterly. "'Saucy and ungrateful. "'You don't remember how I've taken care of you all these years, "'nor how I saved your life when you had the scarlet fever. "'You don't care for anything except to do just as you please. "'But I can tell you one thing, Miss Peggy Clayton. "'Your day is most over. "'I guess you'll find the difference when your stepmother comes. "'I guess you won't have quite such an easy time, then.' "'At the word stepmother, all Peggy's color fled from her face.' She stood gasping and white, staring at Nurse in horror. Then she pulled herself up in fine scorn. "'You are just saying that,' she said indignantly. "'You know my father wouldn't marry again.' "'Huh?' Nurse's own racked feelings were glad of a chance to vent themselves. "'I guess I don't know any such thing. Your father is going to be married inside of a month. He's been calling on her night after night in Carver.' and I'm glad somebody else is going to have the training of you. By this time next year, I guess you'll wish you had your old nurse back. With a sniff and a choke, she left the room. For several minutes after she had gone, Peggy stood motionless. Suddenly she dropped onto the floor by the couch and buried her face in the cushions. Mother, mother, she sobbed, her little frame shaking with anguish. Oh, it can't be true. It can't be. There can't be anyone come to take your place. Father wouldn't let him. I know he wouldn't. But her words did not convince herself. She knew that Nurse never lied, and the only chance was that there was some mistake. I know what it is, she said to herself at length, drying her eyes and looking a little comforted. Daddy's been visiting some sick lady for a long time, and they think he is going to marry her. It's just people's talk. It isn't true. I know it isn't. This seemed a reasonable explanation, both of her father's unusual absences and of the town gossip. For a few days she believed it, or persuaded herself that she believed it. Yet really, she was always half expecting to hear that, after all, Nurse was right. She bore, meanwhile, such a quiet, strangely unchildlike air that Nurse was almost abashed. She never once dared to say anything more about the matter, which was by now all over the town.
End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The trial has come. But one day Peggy overheard two of her teachers talking about her father and his wife to be. She could not catch the name of the future stepmother, but the evident certainty in the women's minds and the things they said finally made the truth come home to her. Her father was to be married. Her own dear dead mother's place was to be taken by some other woman. It was only the morning recess, but Peggy slipped out of the schoolyard. For the next two hours she hardly knew where she went. At first she was merely filled with a sense of the burning injustice that was being done to her mother. She could but just remember the tall, stately lady who had died when Peggy was hardly five years old. But the memory meant all that was most sweet and sacred in her short life. To think that that place was to be filled by some strange woman seemed more than she could bear. Soon, too, she began to remember all the horrible stories she had heard of stepmothers. They not only hated their stepchildren, according to Nurse, but they made fathers dislike their own children. Sometimes they even drove the poor little things out of the house. Peggy was in the woods half a mile from home when all the terror of these thoughts came to her. She and the boys were to be scolded, beaten, and their dear father taught to hate them. Then she thought to herself remorsefully that she was wicked to believe he could ever turn against his little daughter and sons. But again she remembered what she had once heard Nurse say to Sally. There isn't anything a wicked woman can't make a man do. And everyone agreed that stepmothers were all bad beyond description. So there was no hope for it. Ted and Harry and she were to be outcasts, hated and scorned, with a loving father turned into a very fiend of ferocity. Peggy's imagination was always one of her strong points. The pictures she conjured up now of all the horrible things that would happen were so vivid and real that it seemed almost as if they were happening that minute. Down on the snow she dropped and big sobs shook her little body till the very well of tears had completely dried up. Exhausted at length with the fury of her grief, she sat up, a miserable heap of a girl. Her face was almost as white as the drifts of snow about her. Presently she began talking aloud to herself. Never any more father to love us, nobody to put us to bed, because of course she won't let nurse stay, everybody hating us all the time. It will be just the same as if we were babes in the woods, only we won't have any robins to cover us up with leaves. Most likely we'll die of starvation and nobody will care. Oh dear, oh dear, if we only hadn't been born, or if only something could happen to us right off quick so we needn't stay any more. She paused a minute and clasped her hands together tightly. Why, she whispered, looking about furtively as if someone could hear her. Why, we could go away ourselves. Nobody wants us. We'd better go. Mrs. Baker said she'd be glad to have me any time. I'm sure she would take the boys, too, when she heard about the stepmother. Most likely in a little while I could earn some money and take care of us all. Peggy was not exactly sure how this could be done. But she had earned as much as two dollars in one season picking berries and selling them to her father. Consequently, she believed she could easily get something to do, enough to pay their board at least. There was no time to be lost, she thought rapidly. No one seemed to know exactly when the stepmother was to arrive. Everybody appeared to think, however, that it would be soon, perhaps by tomorrow. It was past noon now. Unless she hurried, the boys would have finished luncheon and returned to school before she got home. To her relief, she found them still at the table. Both boys looked gloomy and sullen, but she was too full of her own thoughts to be curious about them. As soon as the meal was over, however, Ted laid hold upon her. Before she had time to tell him the dreadful news, he and Harry had dragged her up to the nursery. "'Nurse says we've got to go to bed again before supper,' began Teddy, viciously kicking over a chair. 
"'And tisn't for a thing,' interrupted Harry, "'just for nothing except because she's so ugly herself.' "'That makes three suppers in a week,' continued Ted. "'All for nothing, too. One thing.' He wagged his head triumphantly and unbuttoned his blouse. "'I wasn't going to be hungry tonight.' As he spoke, he pulled out a couple of slices of bread and butter, a big apple, and some cookies, mostly broken into crumbs. "'I took something, too,' said Harry, drawing out a sticky wad of gingerbread around which he had wrapped a piece of roast beef. Peggy's eyes glowed victoriously. It was evident that the boys were in a frame of mind favorable for her scheme. "'What's it all about, anyway?' she asked. I told you just nothing, said Ted promptly. We got out early today because Miss Green is sick and we needn't go back till tomorrow. So on our way home we stopped at the store. Harry hadn't spent his allowance at all this week and I had five cents left of mine. And Mr. Pratt, he had the greatest pistol you ever saw. You snapped it and it went off like a big firecracker, all without any kind of a cap. It made a most elegant noise, now I tell you. When we got home, we went out and fired it at Cook. She's got some sense. She just laughed and said, What a fine creature it is, to be sure. Then we crept up here, and Nurse was sitting by the window. She never heard us, and I pulled the trigger and pop. Oh, you ought to have seen her. Teddy slapped his knees and danced up and down in his glee. She jumped about ten feet, and she got just white. And then didn't she scold, said we weren't little gentlemen, that no nice boy would scare a woman, just as if a toy pistol ought to scare anybody. Well, we didn't stay to hear all her talk. We went out to the hen yard, and we... He looked at Harry, and both boys chuckled with wicked delight. Oh, let me tell, said Harry. Ted, he gave me the pistol, and we crawled up soft to those cochinchinas nurse got last week. Then all of a sudden he leaned over quick and caught that fat strutting rooster, and then I banged with the pistol right side of Mr. Rooster's head. And you never saw anything like it, continued Harry. He gave the most awful squawk and jerked away like two-forty. And if you'll believe it, he did jump right out of Ted's hands. But he left, oh, he left all his tail feathers behind. Ha, ha, ha. The two graceless imps danced around the room, shaking with laughter. Peggy thought it was a pretty good joke, too, though she knew perfectly well how dear to Nurse's heart those Cochinchinas were. With them she had hoped to take a prize at the county fair. Well, said Peggy, what happened then? The boy's hilarity vanished. She came out, said Ted in disgust and she snatched the pistol away. She says she's going to burn it up, and she told us we'd have to go to bed without our supper. That's all we're punished for, just nothing, only a handful of old rooster feathers that will grow right out again. Peggy looked solemnly at the two boys. Nurse treats us bad enough, she said impressively, and we keep getting punished for nothing, but we're going to have a worse time yet. We're going to have a stepmother. Ted and Harry looked at her questioningly. What's a stepmother? asked Harry. She's a bad, wicked woman who makes father think we're horrid. She'll turn nurse away, and we won't have even enough to eat. Harry stood gazing with frightened eyes, but Ted sniffed rather contemptuously. Huh. Stepmother just means a lady who marries father and comes here to live and we call her mama. I know, cause I had stepmother in my spelling lesson and Miss Green told me. That's all right, said Peggy severely, but that doesn't say what kind of a woman she is, does it? And I know she will be horrid. Nurse says they always whip and punish children and make their own fathers hate them. Cora May said so too, for her grandmother told her. Here she remembered that Cora's new mother must be home by now. She wondered why Cora hadn't sent for Dr. Clayton to take her back to her grandmother. It's just as well, she thought mournfully, for he would probably side with the stepmother himself. 
The boys looked miserable enough. "'When's the stepmother coming?' asked Ted. "'I don't know, but soon. Maybe tomorrow.' Soon, to Peggy's mind, could not mean a date much farther off. "'Will she beat us just as soon as she comes?' Harry got nearer Peggy and held on to her dress. "'Not if I know it,' said Peggy with determination. In the excitement of planning her campaign, she had lost something of her own first terrible feelings. She spoke now like an already successful general. "'I am going to run away before she comes. I'm going this very afternoon, and if you want to, you can come with me.' "'Where are you going?' said Ted in an awed whisper. "'I'm going to Elsie Baker's in Scranton. Mrs. Baker will be glad to have us, I know. She will keep us till I can earn enough money to support all of us.' Peggy's tone of assurance was a wonderful thing to hear, but Ted was not quite satisfied. "'Supposing Father comes after us and takes us back home. Then he'd whip us sure for running away.' Peggy shook her head impatiently. "'Don't you see? He won't want us to come back. Stepmother will make him hate us, and she'll be so glad we are gone that he will be glad, too.' "'Oh, dear!' Harry's lip trembled. "'I don't want Father to hate us. I don't want any wicked old stepmother.' Peggy put her arms around him and kissed him. "'If we go away before she comes, perhaps Father will love us by and by.' Maybe he will get tired of stepmother and send her off. Then we can come back. She said this to comfort Harry. In her own mind, she was quite sure that once in the power of a stepmother, even Dr. Clayton himself would be helpless. End of Chapter 8「Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. Running away from home. Having thus impressed the boys, she easily persuaded them to go with her that very afternoon. Their first preparation was to break open their banks. Peggy took the coppers and silver pieces and tied them up into a handkerchief and put the handkerchief into the bottom of a small bag. I had two dollars and sixteen cents, she said. Ted a dollar and ninety-three cents, and Harry eighty-four cents. That is more than enough to pay our fare to Scranton, because tickets are only half a dollar. On top of the money, she put the pieces of luncheon the boys had saved, first done up, however, in a newspaper. Just as they were about ready to leave the house, they heard their father drive up and the door slam after him as he came hurrying in. Very quietly they slipped down the back stairs, where a whispered conversation took place in the hall. The boys wanted to go to the office to say goodbye. Peggy's own heart was very full. She would have given anything for a kiss and hug from the father she adored. But she was afraid if they went in they would never get away, and then the stepmother would arrive and all the awful things she had read and heard about would commence. She therefore prevailed upon the other two not to stop. "'We'll say good-bye to him through the window,' she said. Out of the door, around the porch, up the piazza steps they crept and gazed through the long French window. Dr. Clayton was standing with his back to the fireplace reading a letter. Peggy looked till a blinding mist swept over her eyes. "'Good-bye, dear Daddy,' she said under her breath. She thought to herself that, if he could see the three faces peering at him so sorrowfully, he would be tempted to give up the stepmother and keep his children. They were a decidedly subdued trio as they passed out of the front gate and turned into a side street. This led to the station, and they kept along for some time without saying a word. Ted was on one side of Peggy, and Harry on the other. Somehow though usually they would have scorned such a proceeding, each held one of her hands. "'Is it very long to the station?' Harry's voice had a suspicious tremor. "'Why, no,' said Peggy briskly. "'It took an awful little while to go in the buggy the other day. 
Seems if we must be pretty near it now. The truth was the Perrytown station was over two miles from Dr. Clayton's house. As none of the children had ever walked there, they did not realize its distance. For a few minutes longer they walked on, no one saying anything. Then, without a word of warning, Harry suddenly dropped down onto the snow by the side of the fence and began to cry bitterly. "'I'm not going away from father,' he sobbed. I don't want to go to Mrs. Baker's. I want to go home. Peggy sat down beside him and took his hand. All her efforts to comfort and encourage him had not the slightest effect. He wanted his father, he moaned, and he didn't believe his father would let a stepmother treat him badly. Here, Teddy, who had been standing by in deep thought, swallowed hard twice. Peggy, he said slowly without looking at her. That's just what I think. I don't believe Father will let anybody be mean to us. You know he doesn't allow even Nurse to whip us. And when she puts us to bed, why... He blushed shamefacedly. I guess we need it. I've been thinking we aren't always very nice to Nurse. Peggy stood up and stared at them both with a mixture of dread and anger in her eyes. Do you mean you aren't going with me after all? At that, Harry began to cry harder than ever. Don't you go and leave us, Peggy. Let's all go home and take care of each other. There was deep scorn in Peggy's voice as she answered. I'm not a baby if you are. I'm not going to be beaten and banged and starved by any old stepmother. You needn't think father will be able to prevent it either, she added. "'Tisn't that he is mean, but he just can't help himself if a wicked woman makes him. "'I don't believe,' said Teddy staunchly, "'that my father will have anything to do with a wicked woman. "'If he does marry a stepmother, I don't believe she will be so horrid.' "'Anybody would be horrid,' wailed Peggy. "'Who would come and take our own dear mother's place away from her?' But the boys had not the clear remembrance of their mother that Peggy had. Thus this side of the case did not strike them as it did her. Besides, home was home and father was father. The possible future stepmother did not seem half so real and terrible as the loss of these two. And also the station was a long way off. Very well, said Peggy sternly at length. You can go back if you want to. I shall keep straight on. If you want to leave me alone, you can. The boys begged and pleaded with her, but she resolutely refused to turn. Poor Harry cried as if his heart would break at the thought of leaving her. Perhaps in the end both boys might have gone with her. But suddenly Teddy had a bright thought. While Peggy was diving into the bottom of the bag for the roll of money, he whispered to Harry. Don't worry, he said. Father will bring her back, sure. She will be home this very night, see if she isn't. Here, said Peggy as she pulled out the handkerchief bundle, here's your money. Neither boy would touch it. You can send it to us, said Ted, if you don't need it. They were saving every penny for a camera and Peggy knew it. She was therefore much impressed by their generosity. Leaving her in the lurch seemed less heartless after that. Very slowly the two walked back, turning many times before they reached the bend that hid them from sight. By that time the cheeks of both boys were wet with splashing tears. Only their faith that their father would come at once after Peggy prevented them from joining her again. Meanwhile Peggy gazed after them till the big lump in her throat grew and grew, when the most desperate straining of eyes failed to see even so much as a bit of a familiar hat or coat-tail, she sank down on the snow. She had kept very brave and firm before them, but now the lump in her throat seemed to have a string connected with the cords of her heart. The hurt of the pull was alone enough to make a body cry. That was the excuse this small girl made to herself as she finally wiped away the last of the salt water that was all over her face. Pretty soon, beginning to feel hungry, she ate some of Harry's gingerbread. "'Oh, dear,' she said to herself in dismay as she took the last bite. 
I forgot to tell them not to let anyone know where I am. Somebody will be sure to come for me before I can reach the station. She remembered, however, that Nurse was to be out that afternoon. Also that the doctor usually did not come in much before tea. In that case, she would be able to get to the train before anyone started after her. Once in Scranton, she believed she would be safe. So she plodded on as fast as she could go. Every little while she heard a horse coming up the street. Each time she waited in terror lest it should be someone for her. But the few sleighs that went jingling by held only strangers. No one noticed the little figure in the warm ulster with the bag and muff. By and by the houses got much farther apart. Then came an immense stretch of pasture land. This was the beginning of a farm that continued for an interminable space. Peggy had entirely forgotten this whole locality. The path seemed strangely wild and unfamiliar to her, and she almost feared she had lost her way. Still, she felt very sure she had not passed any other road, so she kept bravely on. By this time she was getting sadly tired. Her long tramp in the morning, combined with the deep mental strain and excitement, were making this last pilgrimage altogether too much for her strength. It was cold, too, she thought, as she hugged her muff tighter. And what a wilderness of nothing but snow! Wasn't she ever going to see a house any more? And where, oh, where was that station? It seemed as if she must already have gone more than three times the distance. Ted and Harry, she thought, had got home long before this. Evidently they had found no one at the house. That, of course, was just what she hoped would happen. Yet, queerly enough, it made her feel very forlorn and choky. "'You are as big a baby as the boys,' she said to herself in disgust. "'Have you forgotten stepmother?' The thought made her hasten her lagging footsteps. But how tired she was! She found it harder and harder work to move her feet at all. Suddenly she realized that the daylight was all gone. The short winter twilight had commenced, and soon now it would be night. So far as she could see, there was nothing ahead of her. Nothing but wide white fields, broken here and there by a clump of bare brown bushes or a few tall naked trees. There was no place to rest. She could only keep on, hoping every minute that some turn would show the railroad station. For what seemed to her more than an hour, she stumbled ahead, every step slower and more dragging than the one before. Presently she stopped with a frightened gasp. There was no longer even any twilight. Night had already begun. Then Peggy's brave heart failed her. For the first time she felt thoroughly frightened. She shuddered at each mound of snow and every dark shrub. All the demons and ogres and wicked sprites she had read of in fairy books seemed working on every side. She was mortally afraid to go ahead, and she was altogether too scared to go back. Just as the last bit of her strength was about gone, the road took an unexpected turn about a thick growth of trees. There on the other side was a big barn or shed. Peggy could see no house near, and there was nothing homelike or inviting in the big blank wall before her. To the cold, frightened, worn-out child, however, it was like a very haven of rest and safety. If only she could get in. The big sliding door was pulled to and beyond her strength to open. Beside it, however, was a small one, and to her delight she found it unfastened. Once inside, the deep gloom and impenetrable corners were almost as fearsome as the night without. For a few minutes she stood hesitating, not daring to move. Gradually her eyes got slightly more used to the dim interior. What was that great big black thing over in the corner opposite? She stared and stared, hardly breathing. Presently she gave a glad cry. She knew where she was now and the deadly fear was all gone for that tall, wide shape was old Mr. Haskell's barouche. Peggy had ridden in it too many times not to know it now. She did not stop to wonder how she had come to this barn, which was not at all on the road to the station. She only felt as if that old barouche meant home and comfort. Mr. Haskell's house must be somewhere near, she knew, but she was too tired to try to find it. 
In the carriage was a big buffalo robe, and under that she crawled, and in two minutes she was fast asleep. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Rescue and Return. During this time, Ted and Harry had gone forlornly home. As Peggy supposed, they found there neither nurse nor father. It was nearly six o'clock when the doctor arrived. In a very few minutes his two unhappy, excited boys had told him the day's troubles. "'You got here at three o'clock?' he exclaimed in dismay. "'She must have taken the 4.30 train for Scranton, then.' Without stopping for any more particulars, he rang up the station-master on the telephone. Peggy, came the reply, had not been seen there at all. "'She must be lost, then,' thought the doctor." But to be lost in Perrytown was much less terrible than to be wandering the streets of a city like Scranton. Jim was ordered back with the horse and sleigh, and with two lighted lanterns they set out on a search. They drove rapidly down the street Peggy had first taken. Here they hardly looked at all. Before long, however, the road to the station swung off to the left. The main highway, on the contrary, kept straight on, and here was where Dr. Clayton thought Peggy might have made a mistake. With a lantern in each hand, he got out and examined the tracks and the snow on both sides. Finally, on the main road, he found some small footprints, and beside one of them a few big crumbs of gingerbread. This decided him to try that direction first. Every once in a while they saw the small prints in the snow, and at last they came to Mr. Haskell's barn. The tracks led up to the little door. With his heart beating a hard tattoo, Dr. Clayton picked up a lantern and jumped before the horse had stopped. At first, like Peggy, he saw nothing but deep shadows. Then the light from the lantern fell full upon the barouche. A few wide strides brought the doctor beside it, and there, curled up in the furry robe, was Peggy, fast asleep. The gleams from the lantern showed a very pale little face where the tears had scarcely yet dried. Her father leaned over her tenderly with a big gulp in his throat. Very gently he lifted the robe, and then with great care picked up the sleeping child. She stirred uneasily a moment, but the day had been too hard for anything much short of a bomb to waken her now. Sound asleep in his arms she stayed till they entered their own front door. Ted and Harry, who had been waiting in a very fever of anxiety, rushed out into the hall. Before they could be hushed, their wild hurrahs succeeded in reaching even Peggy's sleeping ears. While she was still only half-conscious, her father carried her into the office and shut the boys out. Peggy's first thought, when she was once fairly awake, was one of surprise at finding herself on the office couch. Generally, when she woke up, it was in her own little room. Generally, too, it was morning. Now the lighted lamp showed it must be night. She turned over perplexedly and lifted herself up by her elbow. Then she saw her father sitting beside her. Hello, Daddy, she smiled sleepily. How did I get here? For the moment she had entirely forgotten all the day's experiences. Instead of answering, Dr. Clayton bent and kissed her, took her up in his arms, and sat down in a big chair before the open fire. By that time she was beginning to remember. Why, she said hesitatingly, I was in Mr. Haskell's barn, and, and I ran away. Oh, she started up with a gasp. Has the stepmother come? Peggy, there was something in her father's tone that quieted her at once. For how many years have you been my little daughter? I'll be eleven next May, she answered softly. How many times in those years has father beaten you? Why, never. Peggy snuggled closer to him. What has he ever done to show that he hated any of his children? Never done anything, 
Peggy's face was flame color, but she looked squarely into her father's eyes. Do you think he loves you all or not? Dr. Clayton's tone was very deep and tender, and the child's heart began to beat painfully. I know you love us dearly, she whispered, and, and I didn't run away from you, Daddy. I was afraid of the stepmother. Peggy, if I love my children, how could I let anyone else be bad to them? But, but, her voice was broken. But Nurse says all stepmothers are bad, and Cora May's grandmother told her they make fathers hate their children. Dr. Clayton smoothed back Peggy's rumpled hair. If that was true, little maid, what kind of a father would I be if I ever let a stepmother come near you? Peggy choked. Nurse and everybody says you are going to marry a stepmother and... and... Nobody could be nice who would take my own dear mother's place away from her. It had all come out in a burst. A deep flush spread over her father's face. For a minute he stared at the fire without speaking. Then he turned his eyes to Peggy's wretched little countenance, and he smiled tenderly. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Leanne Howlett. The Stepmother and Peggy's Thanksgiving. Little maid, he began, I am going to tell you a story. Once there was a father and a mother and three tiny children. They were all very happy together, and the father loved the mother more than words could begin to tell. One day, when the oldest child, who was a little girl, was about five years old, the dear mother was taken very sick. Nothing the father could do could make her well. The angels came and took her away with them to heaven. Here Peggy put up her hand and stroked his face gently. Then the father and the three children went on the doctor, were left alone. Though the children were too young to remember their mother very well, the father always remembered her better and better, and he was lonesome beyond all telling. So he worked harder than ever to make the days go quicker. After five or six years he hadn't forgotten the dear mother at all, but he was beginning to see that he had not the right kind of a home for the three children. He was away most of the time and they were left with a nurse. The nurse meant to do well, but she was not a very wise woman. The children were growing up a little rough and unruly, not at all as their mother would like to have them. They didn't always mind, and sometimes they even had fights together. Dr. Clayton stopped a minute and looked searchingly at Peggy, who blushed furiously. They didn't fight very often, she murmured apologetically. Altogether too often for loving brothers and sisters, said her father, shaking his head. Now, he continued, about this time the father had learned to know a very sweet and gentle lady. He had grown very fond of this lady, but that didn't mean that the memory of the mother was any less dear or sacred to him. This new friend, this gentle lady, was very, very fond of children, too. The father knew his little folks would be much better and much happier if she could always be with them. He knew she would take care of them and teach them all the things their own mother would have taught them. She doesn't expect them to love her more than they did that first dear mother, but I am sure if they only give her a fair chance they will love her very, very dearly indeed. By this time Peggy was crying softly with her face hidden. Dr. Clayton gently turned it up to his, and then he spoke more seriously even than he had spoken before. Peggy, if my little maid cannot say with all her heart that she will do her best to make a happy home for the loving lady, the lady shall never come at all. Can't you trust your father, Peggy? Peggy's arms went close about his neck. A very tearful, contrite little voice whispered, I do trust you now, father, and I'll try to love the new mother. 
Just then there was a knock on the office door, and Dr. Clayton called, Come in, without getting up. When the door opened, Peggy tumbled out of his lap in such a hurry that she almost fell sprawling on the floor. For the visitor was Miss Edith Barton. My Miss Barton, shouted Peggy. She forgot her tears, her great trial, all the disagreeable and harrowing experiences of the day, and the delight of seeing this dear friend. She did not notice, as she hung on one arm after giving Miss Barton a sounding kiss, that her father had taken the young lady's other hand and was still holding it. "'When did you get back? Are you going to stay for good now?' Peggy questioned breathlessly. Miss Barton laughed. "'I only arrived a couple of hours ago. Jim drove by me on the street and told me you had been lost, so I came up at once to find out what was the matter.' Dr. Clayton interrupted Peggy's answer. She ran away, he said solemnly, to escape the clutches of a wicked stepmother. Miss Barton's face turned very pink, and she looked at Dr. Clayton imploringly. Did you, Peggy? she asked tremulously. Peggy nodded. Yes, I did, she said with dropped eyes, but I'm not going to run away any more. Father says she won't be horrid and that she'll love me, and, and I'm going to try to love her for Father's sake. Miss Barton put both arms around the little maid. Frank, she spoke over Peggy's head, you ought to tell her. Dr. Clayton laughed blithely. Peggy, he said, do you think you could love your new mother as much as you do this interloper here? Peggy shook her head. I don't know what an interloper is, but it doesn't sound good. I'll try to love the stepmother, she said seriously. But, Daddy, you know nobody could be quite so nice as Miss Barton. Her father laughed again, but there was a suspicious blur about his eyes. Then, to Peggy's intense surprise, he turned to Miss Barton and, putting his arm around her waist, bent over and kissed her. That is just what I think, Peggy. Nobody could be quite so nice. That's why she's going to be the stepmother. Peggy stood staring, her mouth and eyes wide open. For a moment she could not believe what was so evidently the truth. When at last the full meaning of it all came to her, the joy in her eyes fairly transfigured the little face. Softly she clasped her hands together as she gazed at the two dear people before her. "'Daddy, dear Daddy,' she whispered, "'and Mama Edith.' Miss Barton said afterward that those words of the little ten-year-old made her feel as if no other ceremony was needed to make theirs a true wedding. The next day Peggy was none the worse for her tramp in the cold and sleep in the barn, which, nurse said severely, was more good fortune than she deserved. If it hadn't been for the buffalo robe, she added, you would probably have frozen in the barn. The doctor's long talk with nurse had made her feel that she was largely responsible for Peggy's escapade. She was doubly sorry, too, for all her words, now that she knew Miss Barton was to be the stepmother. Curiously enough, no one had suspected that she would be the future Mrs. Clayton. The doctor's visits to Carver were supposed to be intended for the cousin with whom she was staying. As for Peggy, she was so happy that she had almost forgotten her dread and fears of yesterday. That very day came a letter from Cora May. My new mother is here, Cora wrote, and she is the dearest new mother you ever saw. She says I can visit grandmother whenever I want, and that grandmother must visit us often. Home is much nicer than it was before. Ted, said Peggy impressively as she read the letter, you don't ever want to believe any bad thing about anybody till you see her yourself. I think stepmothers are all beautiful. When a man like my father, answered Ted oracularly, marries a stepmother, you can just be sure that she's most as splendid as he is himself. End of chapter 11
End of Peggy's Trial by Mary Knight Potter Recording by Leanne Howlett